This is really behind everything that's transforming our culture right now. Even non-believers are saying, this is crazy. What is happening to America? What's happening to the children? What are they doing? Non-believers are saying that. We've been witnessing this massive transformation of our culture in America and the West. It, could there be a mystery behind it? And could the mystery go back, first of all, to the Bible, which it always does, and then, and then can it go back to the ancient Mesopotamia where you have these tablets and inscriptions and you have these entities, you know, we call gods, and could there be something more to them, more than just fiction, more than just mythology? Could there be something linked to the spirits? And if so, could they be at work right now? And if so, how would that happen? And so the return of the gods is opening up this mystery. There's a real warning about this from Jesus, which people don't realize, about what's happening right now. And it's behind literally every cultural change, what's happening to the family, what's happening to marriage, what's happening to children, what's happening to our culture in every way and where it's going. And so it's really a stunning thing. It's some, for some people, it's scary. Other people, it's like, wow, you know, that explains it. Yeah, it makes sense. The Bible actually says it from the beginning. So we're dealing with this and could it be behind even Supreme Court decisions, what we see in our television? And if so, where is it all going? Where is it heading? And what do we need to know as believers? How do we deal with it and how do we overcome? Why is it that wherever you go in the world, we're talking about the ancient times, uh, Russia, Hawaii, Mesopotamia, Africa, Latin America, doesn't matter. Everybody's worshiping gods. I mean, everybody's worshiping right. And the Bible says that in Deuteronomy and then in Psalm 106, it says that when they were worshiping these gods or these idols, they were actually worshiping something called the Shedim in Hebrew. And Shedim means spirits or entities. In, in the, the Babylonians called it the Shedu, similar word, but they said they could be good or bad spirits, but in the Bible it's only bad or dark spirits. So behind right. the gods, and it's saying is that these spirits can actually follow or play on the mythology. And also the mythology can pick up something in the spiritual realm. And so, you know, that's the first thing. Secondly, when the Bible was translated into Greek, the very first translation ever, the Septuagint, which was made by ancient scholars a few centuries before the New Testament, they had to come up with a word or find the word that would translate Shedim. And the word they used was daimonia, from which we get the word demonic or demon. Wow. So when Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, he says the pagan world, they're worshiping these idols. They're actually worshiping the daimonia. So it's saying again that behind all these things that, and then the amazing thing is that in the Bible, when you're reading about possession, there's signs of spiritual possession. Well, you see those signs throughout the pagan world. It's universal. All across the world, the pagan world would describe what we know is spirit possession. The shaking and, and the convulsing and the self-harm and all these things, that's part of pagan worship. And the closer you went to the gods, like the high priest or the oracles, the more you saw the signs of it. The closer you went in uh, worship, and they said they believed they were being possessed by the gods. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. but the gods were spirits. For instance, in the ancient world, you had the Oracle of Delphi, famous seer. They, everybody went to her to get revelation. Emperors went to her. Well, this woman said she's speaking for the gods. She would shake, she would tremble, she would foam at the mouth, she would babble. And this is a possessed woman. Again, it was supposed to be the spirit of the god. It was the spirit of that. In fact, she was called Pythia, which comes from the word python or serpent. You know, in the Bible, we know serpent is linked to the demonic. And so, so you have right. all the signs. So it's, and it's not only that you had signs of possession in the ancient world, in the pagan world, but we think of possession as one person. Well, yeah, of course, that, that is the first case of possession. But entire cultures can be possessed, can be wow. under the influence of spirits, entire civilizations. So we've got this entire world under the influence of the gods, the spirits. It's really possessed cultures. But then something happens, and that is that... They, the gods disappear, or the or in Western civilization, the gods depart. Why? What happened? What happened was Jesus happened. Jesus wow. came into the world. Not only did he have the power to cast out spirits, but also he sent the gospel, the word of God, into the world. So now you have God coming into the land of the gods. Now you have a clash. Now you have the spirit coming into the land of the spirits. You've got monotheism and polytheism. And so you have a clash. You've got a war. And when you look at the book of Acts, you see the first signs of it. You see the signs of these uproars over the gospel because of the gods. Or a spirit-possessed woman follows Paul. 
he casts out the spirit and the entire city goes into an uproar. In another place, they want to kill the disciples because of the god Artemis, because they feel it's right. a threat. Well, when you read about the early Christians, they're being persecuted because of the gods. They were told, if you just will worship this god, our gods, we will not imprison you, we will not throw you to the lions, but they refused. It was ultimately over the gods, and it's a real spiritual war. But in the end, the gospel prevails. And the gods, in a sense, depart. The temples of Zeus are abandoned. You know, the, the shrines of Dionysus basically fade away into ruins. And so it, it disappears. But the thing is, it's not just gods. If behind the gods are spirits, spirits don't mm -hmm. die. So what happens to the spirits? And could they come back? And there's an actual ancient warning that I put in the book, The Return of the Gods, that actually Jesus gives that we don't realize is a warning and a prophecy of what's happening now. Hey everyone, this is Troy Black, and I've got Rabbi Jonathan Kahn with me today, and we're going to be discussing The Return of the Gods. So this is a book that Jonathan Kahn just recently released, but it also is a mystery involving something that happened in the ancient worlds with the quote-unquote gods and what's happening in today's culture as well. So Jonathan, this was one of the most fascinating things to me in this book, honestly, was this idea where you talk about this, the, the house of spirits. And I, I'm actually going to read a quote real fast. So this is from page 230. You said, a house that has emptied itself of God cannot remain empty. It will be seized and taken over by that which is not God. So you've just talked about how the gospel of Jesus Christ went into the world and essentially uprooted the gods, you know, and uprooted the spirits from the place that they were dwelling and cast them out. So what happens when that's reversed? What happens after that if if God doesn't take root? Yeah. yeah. And with that, you know, the, the, the thing, Troy, is that, you know, it happened in the, in the Roman Empire, but everywhere the gospel went and prevailed, it happened there too. It, and the thing is, right. what happened in Rome or the, the Western world, really was the greatest mass exorcism in human history. And and so we don't always wow. realize that. That's what made Western civilization so unique was the gospel. It's the one fully exorcised civilization in this way. But wow. Jesus gives a warning and, you know, he gives a parable. And, and the parable is, and many people know it, but there's a whole other realm to it. And that is, he says, when a spirit leaves a man, meaning the man is delivered, a spirit leaves the man, it says it goes to look for a place to dwell in dry places, doesn't find any, says, I will return to my house. Now, now my house is the guy. He's speaking about the man as a house because spirits inhabit the, the man. So right. it becomes his habitation. And he says, my, like he never gave up that idea that he owned the man. And so comes back to the man or the house, finds the house clean, swept, you know, in order, and then says, I'm going to bring my friends, goes back, brings seven other spirits, more evil than it, than the first, they come back, they repossess the house, and Jesus said that the the latter state is worse than the first state. Now, wow. now the first application is, and we would naturally think this, and it's true, is that, you know, aside of somebody who's been delivered of spirits, you never go back because it's going to be worse. I mean, that's true with everything. You don't go back, you know. Um, so that's the first thing. But the second thing is at the end of this parable, as recorded in Matthew, he says, he says, so it shall be with this generation. Now, he's not wow. talking about one man anymore. He's talking about an entire generation, a culture, a civilization. And so when you take this, Troy, to the, the max of like the, the most global application, is that any nation, culture, or civilization, particularly Western civilization, that has been delivered of the spirits, delivered of the gods, the spirits, if it should ever turn away from God, then if it should ever empty itself of God, the house, as you said there, is not going to remain empty. What's going to happen is the spirits that were cast out will return. In the case of, of our civilization, which, uh, which is America is the heir to that, what it means is the same spirits that were cast out in the first century are coming back. Those demonic, dark spirits in the oh. form th that were masked with the gods. The gods will return to America. And when I say America, the West as well. And the West is affecting the whole world. So they will return for one purpose, to repossess it, to repossess wow. the house. So if you want to understand what has been happening to America 
for over half a century, since the 60s particularly, what we are witnessing is a repossession of Western culture. Repossession and the spirits that we're talking about were, in a sense, pagan spirits. They're not obviously godly spirits. They're right. coming back now. Now you have something new. They're coming back to a, quote, Judeo-Christian civilization. That's never been. They're coming back to that. And when they come back, their mission is to take a Judeo-Christian civilization and transform it into a pagan one. The process of paganization. And that is is behind everything we're watching. It's not like progressive, it's liberation. No, it's regressive. What we are watching in every realm is a return to pagan civilization, except the warning of Jesus is when they come back, it's gonna be worse. Um, you know, wow. and, and the thing is, now think about this, you know, just as a test case, what happened to Russia when it turned away from God, turned away from Christianity? What happened wasn't secular in the end. It, what happened was demonic. And I mean, millions wow. of people were killed. What happened when the land of the Reformation, Germany, turned away from God and Christianity? What happened here? They said this is, this is again, secular, national socialism. It wasn't. It was demonic. So now, though, it's happening in America and the West and the world. So what happens in the end will be worse than paganism. What we've known yeah. as that, and really, this kind of dovetails with the end times, what the Bible says about what's coming. Yeah, so what you're sharing here it literally parallels, I think, with my own story. So as I was reading this book and I'm reading about the cultures, I'm thinking, how many lives has this played out in, like personally, not just as culturally? And I know you're flipping it the other way. You're taking something that's normally a personal thing, like demon possession, and you're going, you know, you're saying the whole culture can be possessed. And we can see that, you know, we can see the results of that. But this is something the Lord showed me when I, I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised in the ways of God, hearing the gospel message in church, hearing the gospel at home. And then at, when I went, went off to college, I, I walked away from the Lord in a lot of ways. And I got into a lot of different things. But what came with that was that emptying of myself of the ways of God was suddenly I started to you know experience night terrors, things like even sleep paralysis. I would wake up and have hallucinations. These are things where I was like, wow, this has never happened before. And it, I had a hard time at that moment pinpointing, why is this happening? And I didn't realize that something else had filled the house when, when God was gone, right? And then on top of that came things like hopelessness, depression, insomnia, just all of these things where I had never had these problems before. And I believe what we're seeing in today's culture is we're seeing a connection between all of these issues that are pointing to the possession of a culture and a spirit that's filled the house essentially behind that. So what would it look like if the gods or the spirits were to return? What's the result of that? And which gods in this book are you saying have returned? Yeah, interesting to what you said. Now I'm kind of going from what you said and taking it on a macro level. Look at our culture just without it even knowing anything else. Look at our culture. Look what's happened to our youth. There is a spirit of hopelessness in our culture right. now as never before. There is more suicide in our culture right. now that are just self-destruction this is you know one of the signs of possession is self-harm self-destruction right. and particularly in the youth hopelessness darkness and you know a really a haunted generation and that is the signs of this and so the first thing is you know how would it happen and the only, the only way it can happen is if I'll take, we'll take it to America because that's what we're most familiar with, but it, it right. touches the West as well. It happened in the other nations, but particularly America's leading. And so what happened in America, the nation or the culture would have to start emptying itself of God. And, and so that's exactly what we have seen to happen. Remember, it start becoming an empty house. If it's filled, there's not an issue. Now, if we were alive in the 50s, you know, up to the point of, because the, the point is really, really is, I mean, and it's not saying that there aren't dark things before. It's not saying that, but what it's saying is there's a real turning point in the early 60s. That, the yeah. whole thing, what's happening now. But if you go just before that, you've got a culture where literally you have a nation where the teachers, the secular teachers and the secular school system are teaching the children of America, leading them in the Lord's Prayer. The prayer of that Jesus gave all the teachers all across America. And the, the top movies wow. are things like Ben-Hur, like the Ten Commandments, like Quo right. Vadis, like the robe, like the King of Kings. Well, that was the culture then. But how did we get so transformed? Well, in the early 60s, America begins the process of emptying itself of God. It starts out subtly, as it always does, starts out small. We're going to take prayer out of school. First thing, we're going to take prayer out of school. Um, and now, 
seems like a little thing now, but you know, we can hardly imagine what it was like to have prayer in school now. But the point right. is, it was separating the children from God. It was se- beginning to separate the children of the future. It's separating right. the future from God. And then the next thing was take away the Bible shortly after that from school. Well, you're opening the door now. And the thing is, America had no idea what it was doing because the one thing, and, and you know, if we took the warning of Jesus seriously, this never would have happened. The one thing that was holding back all the darkness was the gospel, was the power of God, was the word of God. It's not saying that everybody in America was Christian. What it's saying is the culture was agreed upon the Christian yeah. faith, upon the Bible, upon the word of God. And so, but the moment you take that out, now the only thing that was holding it back was this. So when you take it out, you know, mm-hmm. Troy, there's never been like another alternative. It's either God or basically paganism in one form or another form. And so wow. once we did that, we emptied the house, Others came in. Now, now think about like like the first thing was the children. So listen, we just take prayer out of the school. Well, look now, what has now come into the schools? What now mm-hmm. has come into the children? Well, it's exactly what's going to happen. So which gods are coming in? And now there are many, you know, Israel, there were many gods and there's also many spirits, but there were three um, principalities in particular that really are the head of this fall. When Israel turned away from God, you know, they, they they went after these gods in particular and were right. really possessed by them, and it led to their destruction. So in the return of the gods, they are called the dark trinity because they're a trinity or a triunity of gods. Um, and the first, first of all, I'll just say their names. The first one is called the possessor. The second one is called the enchantress. And the third is called the destroyer. Now, we're, I know we're going to focus here on one of them. So I'll just give a I'll just give a, an idea of the the first and the third. The first one is possessor. His name in Hebrew means the owner, the Lord. And and we in Hebrew the name is Baal. We know him as Baal. But what mm-hmm. happens is as we take God out this other spirit starts coming into America. And when you look at what Baal did, the spirit of Baal in ancient times, that's exactly what you see happening in America. Baal sought to drive God out of everything, out of the public square, out of the lives of the children, out of everything. Now it's happening in America. Step by step, Baal caused Israel to forget God, the Bible says. Forget God. We've literally wow. forgotten God, and we forgot that we even knew God. That's where we are now in America. Baal caused Israel to overturn the ways of God, the Ten Commandments, the ways. Well, look at what's happened to America. It's been a progressive overturning. We've even struck down the Ten Commandments. Now, I won't go into detail. I'll just give a little taste and to say that this process, it begins the process of paganization. It's affected us in every way. Even wokeism, behind that is paganism. Behind our addiction to computers. I'm not, you know, it's not that technology is bad, but our addiction that is from an ancient pagan mystery. Even the word technology comes from something in the Bible that's linked to wow. idols. Even, even the idea of everybody having their own truth, their authentic truth. If a man says he's a cat, he's a cat. That's pagan. Right. You know, when you have one God, you have one truth. What pagan is, you have many gods and many truths. So it's blurred the lines between man and animal. That's a pagan thing. Now we're doing it through the genetic code. I will not go into detail except to say that In the book, I reveal that even the sign of the possessor, the actual ancient sign manifested in New York City, actually more than once. One of them, I witnessed it. The other is a massive thing. So this is this is the process of paganization. So this this begins it. Now, remember, like this is the first spirit of the Lord's parable. The one that first comes back, he's the enterer. And then he says, "Okay, I'm going to bring my friends. One of them, the third one is called the destroyer. And I will just Mm. say this, the destroyer is the ancient principality that causes parents to offer up their own children as sacrifices. And I will not go into it. You already know where this is going. But amazingly, you know, this culture talks about abortion like it's some liberation, it's some progressive thing. It is the most pagan of acts to offer up your children. I don't care how you do it. And the amazing thing is when I, I put this in the book that when you look at the ancient rituals of this worship of child sacrifice, They all have been manifested now in how we do abortion. It actually, you know, it's we do it high tech, but it's we're following the same things. And do you remember Jesus said that when it comes back, it's worse? Well, Israel offered up thousands of children to Moloch, to the destroyer. Mm -hmm. We have offered up over 60 million of them. 
And that's what caused the judgment of ancient Israel. So there's all sorts of things about all of these that I put in the book, but I know we, we want to focus on the Enchantress, which is the middle right. of the three. And this is special to do this because I believe there's a reason for it. Yeah, so if y'all want to learn more about the Possessor and the Destroyer, that's all found in the book. Yeah, I've got a copy of it here. Uh, I read it a couple months back. And uh, could you just let them know, there's going to be a link below if y'all want to, a direct link, but also how can they get a copy of this book, Jonathan? Yeah, The Return of the Gods is literally everywhere. I encourage people not only to get it for themselves, but get it for the people in their life, because everybody has them who are deep into us. I mean, this affects all of us, everybody. But there are right. people in our lives that are deep into us, so to get it for them as well. But The Return of the Gods is on Amazon. I mean, you know, online, every Christian, every secular store. It was even been in Walmart. It's everywhere where there are books. But I also encourage you to use the link. That's also a, a blessing to Choice Ministry. That's been a blessing to so many people. So let's go into this question. Who is the Enchantress? Let's let's dive deep into this. Yeah, the Enchantress, I interesting. In the Canaanite theology uh, or mythology, she is actually the wife of Baal or the lover of Baal. Um, but the interesting thing is that she appears all over. This is one of the most ancient principalities ever. In fact, the first writings of any kind of, quote, God is the writings about this one. In the Bible, she's called Ashtora. You see that it says Baal and Ashtorah. Baal is first mm -hmm. and Ashtorah. Interesting, because Baal is first and Ashtorah. So when you look at what happened to America, it was the transformation of Baal that was first, that turning, then comes Ashtorah. If you were in Babylon, she was called Ishtar. If you went to Phoenicia, like where Jezebel, actually Jezebel's father was the high priest of her. She was called Astarte. And in Greece, she was called Aphrodite, and in Rome, she was called Venus. Now, we're familiar with the Venus and the Aphrodite, and we think it's right. kind of like a, like maybe it's a nice thing about love, and there's nothing nice about it. This is an ancient, dark principality. This is the goddess of sexual immorality, sexual unbridled, mm -hmm. unbound sexual lust. And she's also called the harlot or the prostitute goddess. So, so if we didn't know anything else, Troy— what would we expect, just going by this, that after America begins to turn away from God, now begins the paganization, then what comes the next spirit? What would we expect to happen if this one returned? We would expect to see a revolution in the realm of sexuality, a revolution yeah. in the realm of family, of marriage. Um, why would we be, well, you know, here's the interesting thing. Remember, she's a prostitute. So what do prostitutes do? They take sex out of marriage and they put it into the culture, into the marketplace, into the public square. And actually, Ashtora or Ishtar, the enchantress, actually what she was known for was sexualizing a culture. And she literally, yeah. her in her worship, in her temples, there would be sexual acts of public. Now, we've never experienced this. In ancient times, this was part of paganism. But in many pagan cultures, we have not experienced it until the 60s. And so what does she do? Mm -hmm. She takes sex out of marriage. She puts it into the culture. She sexualizes American culture, sexualizes Western culture. Sex becomes everywhere. You know, it's funny because when you think about it, you know, where did all this sex come from? I mean, you know, it's like it was stolen from marriage. That's why. So on one hand, a prostitute does that. But a prostitute also weakens marriage. So this principality, at the same moment that she's sexualizing the culture, the sexual revolution, which happens in the 60s, like clockwork, at the same time comes the weakening of marriage, the eroding of marriage, the destruction wow. of homes. You know, I mean, it's no accident. You know, Troy, you know, I mentioned like up to the 60s, if you looked at America, like it's a whole different nation from what we have now. But the other thing is that the morality of America and the West concerning sexuality was basically the same as from the first centuries of Christianity. The same with marriage, the same with adultery, the same with everything. But when this comes in, every change is in the direction of paganism, every single change. Mm -hmm. and, and so the mission of this one, now, now I know we're gonna talk individually, but civilizationally, the mission of this one is to possess a nation in the realm of sexuality and to transform the nation from a Christian nation to a pagan one using sexuality and what this one has done has never stopped to this day it's just gotten deeper and deeper and deeper now one of the things that i told you she was called a prostitute a harlot and, and i and i put the actual inscriptions that i found from mesopotamia well the ancient greeks when they spoke of her she's actually worshipped as a sacred prostitute you know back in paganism prostitution was considered sacred so you have this goddess and in greek the word she was called harlot is the word Porne, 
from wow. which we get the word porn or pornography. Right. And it's not an accident because this is the same principality from which pornography comes. And in fact, the very first pornographic literature is the literature of this goddess from Mesopotamia. Wow. And the effect she had on the culture is not just literature, but she would reproduce the images of naked people all over the culture. The, the images of her are a woman basically trying to expose herself. So the, wow. the first pornographic images and pornographic text comes from her. So what she does is is she she basically there comes an explosion of pornography from the wow. sexual revolution explosion and this thing has so taken over now combined with high technology combined with the internet has so taken over people's lives who don't know the lord and who do know the lord because this is such a potent thing that she uses and even troy even you know we use the word erotica erotic you know erotic culture that word erotic comes from the greek eros eros was actually a god a principality and Eros was a child born of this goddess. So this wow. goddess is the mother of Eros, erotica, and the inventor of porn. Wow. So that's that's just reminding me again of my own story because, you know, like I said earlier, I walked out from under a Christian household where I didn't have free access to the internet anytime I wanted. I didn't have access to a computer anytime I wanted. And then suddenly there were no bounds on my life anymore. And I thought to myself, I am actually experiencing more freedom now that I have access to these things than I had before. But this is something else I pulled. Uh, this is from page 224 in the book. You said the gods had promised that in exchange for abandoning God, they would usher in a culture of freedom. You know, and obviously you go into the different ways that culture assumes that freedom is going to happen, whether by government or by the sexual revolution, all sorts of different areas. But for me personally, that's what I thought. I thought I was experiencing freedom, but I quickly found myself trapped. And I believe there's many believers today, you know, this is not just the culture. I believe there's many believers where this goddess or this spirit, you know, of Ishtar has gotten her foot in the door. And we believe this lie that a little bit is okay, right? But what we see with the house of spirits is you know, the, the spirit doesn't come by itself. It brings all of its friends with it, right? You know, so when the door is opened, even a little bit, and we start to believe that lie, that, hey, this is going to get me more freedom. You know, and I think that really is the lie. We have a culture of we work hard. We have this culture where, you know, even as like ministers, pastors, Christian leaders, even, I believe this is something that the devil is bombarding them with because we're in this place where we're working hard and then we're looking for freedom. And we believe this lie that, oh, this bit of sexual immorality over here is going to give me that freedom I'm looking for. But it's a lie from the enemy who's trying to get his foot in the door and the truth is, there's only freedom found in Jesus Christ. So I was going to ask you to pray at the end, but I want to stop and pray now. I just feel this from the Lord, that there's people listening where you are, are bound by this, this addiction to either pornography, uh, adultery, or any other kind of sexual immorality. And Jonathan, I just want you to pray right now for freedom, because I experienced it the day that I understood the gospel, the day that... Uh, that I repented of my sin, the day that I turned away from the other things I was trying to find freedom in, and I turned to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I experienced true freedom in the Lord, you know, and I am, I'm a walking testimony that he who the Son says free is free indeed, that we can remain free. We don't have to keep going right. back. So I just want you to pray for people yes. listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that, you know, one of the, you know, keep in mind, you said something very eloquently, and that is that, that it brings in its friends. And, you know, one of the things of the first principality called Baal means master. And it, where there were wow. many, the Bible says there were many Baals. You know, there was, he came in many forms. So it master what, what comes as you're going to be free ends up mastering you. You know, right. but the thing is that the, but the Bible says that if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And it says sin shall not master you. Oh. The word Baal is there, shall not master. So you do have the power in the Lord. You do have it. And as you said this, Troy, I'm so glad you said that you actually can be free. You got to believe that first and then receive it. So let's pray for that. For, and listen, we, and listen, by the way, you're not alone. You know, people all over, including in the church, deal with it, but you can be free. That's what life is. You don't want to be a prisoner. Let's pray. Father, we just lift this up to you. We ask your hand and your blessing and your, your spirit, Father. Lord, touch each one who's listening and who will see this, Lord, who will see this in, in now and the days to come. Father, Lord, you know their frame. You know what they're dealing with, Lord, and you know, Lord, what it is to be in bondage. 
Father, but Lord, we ask, Lord, your power. You said if you yes, set Lord. free this one, they will be free indeed. Not just free, but free indeed. And, yes, and you said sin shall not, this is your, this is your word, sin shall not master you. So, Lord, we only want one master, and that's you. And, and, you know, and, Lord, having you as the Lord, that's freedom from everything else. So, Father, Lord, we come before you. We repent of any form of sexual immorality, se the sexual bondage, pornography, lust, adultery, yes, fornication. Um, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, we repent of it, Lord. We turn away, and, Lord, we ask Come into us, everyone listening. Yeah, Jesus. Touch each one, your spirit, Lord. We know, Lord, we don't want an empty house that is vulnerable, yeah, Lord. Jesus. We don't want emptiness. We want fullness. So, Lord, I ask your fullness, the fullness of your spirit, the fullness yes, of Lord. your joy come into your people, the fullness of your presence, the fullness, Father, of your peace, the fullness of, Lord, your blessings, Lord, your delights. It says in your presence is fullness of joy. Lord, I ask for your Spirit, to cleanse out, cast out, cast forth, wash out, wash away, Lord, mind, body, spirit, soul, Father, all things, Lord, that, that we be free, Lord, in every way to walk in the fullness of you, Lord, to walk in the fullness of life, in freedom, in power, and fulfill the calling for which you placed us in our mother's womb. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus the one who sets us free. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was awesome. Yeah. And y'all, just as a quick testimony, what I experienced when that originally happened to me in college, when I got down on my knees, I repented of my sin. I understood the gospel for the first time. The Holy Spirit helped me to understand that it wasn't based on my work. It was based on the work of Jesus on the cross. And I fully turned to him and put my faith in him literally overnight that addiction to pornography fell off of me. I woke up the next day and it was, I was free. And I said, I don't even want to do that anymore. You know, it was amazing. And then with that came the depression fell off, the hopelessness fell off and that can fall off of you as well. And it's only by the power of Jesus Christ. So Jonathan, thank you so much for praying. I want to go into this next topic here. So there's this other side to this goddess that we've been talking about, the enchantress. And this is something that is actually radically affecting our culture today. So what is this? Yeah, something strange. And that again, I found when I looked at the inscriptions in from Mesopotamia concerning, you see it very clearly. The goddess says in one of the inscriptions, I am a woman, I am a man. It says in one of her hymns, you are the one, you turn a man into a woman. You turn wow. a woman into a man. So this principality of sexuality, unbridled, and, and notice how it progresses in America, same exact way. This is also the principality who blurs the line of gender, who breaks the distinction between man and woman, male and female, boy and girl, who merges, replaces, confuses the two. And so this is the spirit of androgyny. This is the, the spirit of what we are dealing with right now. See, the interesting thing is the amazing thing. You know, this could not have happened in the 1960s when it was just beginning. What happened then was the sexual revolution, but the sexual revolution prepared the way because first you take sex out of marriage, then you're gonna take sex out of the context of gender. That's the, mm -hmm. the deeper work. If you can weaken marriage, then you can cause this because marriage is man and woman. So now you have a generation, many of them growing up without man or woman. So what she does is she, she separates men and women. She wants one to replace the other. And so one of the things she does, it's not just sexuality, but also it's in every realm. One of the ancient inscriptions says she grinds away the masculinity of men. So one of the things that she does, and we all know the spirit, it's in the culture, mm -hmm. is to demasculinize men, to, to attack men, to attack the authority of men, to attack fatherhood. You know, back in the very early 1960s, you have shows like Father Knows Best. Can you imagine that today? Right. You've got Homer Simpson now. Fathers are depicted as bumbling idiots, as overgrown children or toxic oppressors. Men are, right. there's an anti-man thing, but it's okay, unless a man is feminine, then he's applauded. So so it's, she seeks to emasculate men, feminize men, even to rechannel boys. You know, men are made, we're supposed to be protectors. We're supposed to be providers. We're supposed to be that. In that. But what she does is she rechannels that all the way. Young men, boys are growing up, all these things are being channeled away. The instinct to protect is now 
spent on video games. The bond of marriage now goes into pornography. So you got an entire generation, you got young men who are never, who are never rising to it. So that's what happens on the side of men. But then it says what she does with women is she masculinizes them. She defeminizes them. She takes them away from motherhood, away from marriage, away from womanhood. And you know, the goddess herself was a woman, but she had male attributes, she male nature. And so what she's trying to make modern woman become in her image. And so you see this happening in the same way. You know, when she's, you know, women, you don't need men. You can be your own man. You know, you, you know, basically that's what the culture is saying. If a man acts masculine, they say it's toxic. If a woman does, they'll say this is wonderful. You know, it's craziness, mm. you know, but we see this throughout. So this has been affecting everything. So when she separates men and women, destroys marriage, you can then do this. This is the next step. It's everywhere. It's in the culture. Even radical feminism, which the angry, raging against man, and the, that comes from her. Wow. She raged against her father. The, there was a patriarchy of gods. You know, so it's all there. But it affects other things as well. Because if you went back in ancient times, you'd find she had a, a mysterious priesthood. They were called the Asinu or the Kalu. And they were men who walked around in her temples dressed up as women, acting wow. as women. And so they're back. When you see this come back, this has been pretty much gone because of the gospel. When you see this coming back, it means the gospel has been pushed out, and now this is filling the house. And then when you see the culture celebrate it, you know the gods have returned, and there's been a turning from God because this is paganism. And, Mm. but you know, remember Jesus said they come back worse. Well, back then she possessed her priesthood. Now she's seeking to possess an entire generation of children. That wow. is why children are the focus now of this. They're in school. They're being told once where they were, they were told, pray to the Lord. Here's the Lord's prayer. Now they're being told you may not be a boy. You may not be a girl. You may be the other. And so that's right. happening. You know, it goes deeper because it says in the ancient inscriptions, she turns a man into a woman. It's interesting. You have, you have, you have inscriptions where it says she dresses the man as a woman and a woman as a man. But it also says she turns a man literally into a woman. Well, she literally had some of her priests not just dress as women, but surgically transitioned into mm. women. And in fact, I found an ancient inscription where the transition men are dancing before her, holding uh, scalpels, like they're celebrating their transition. So, I mean, it's craziness, but until now she is seeking, look, we have an entire generation that is being indoctrinated into this. These are the wow. antis, but this is what we're dealing with. And it has affected the entire culture because I'll give just some very dramatic examples. One is she was the goddess also of parades. And so mm. what were her parades? The ancient inscription says she would cause men to parade through the city streets dressed as women. She would cause women to parade through the city streets dressed as men. Her parades were filled with color, sexual licentiousness, and the bending of gender. Well, they're back. There was one month of the year that she claimed for herself that she especially possessed the culture. Now, I went back to the writings of St. Jerome, the early Christians, because it was still happening then. Early Christians, St. Jerome identifies the month, and it was month of processions, festivals. What month was it? In Latin, he calls it Iunium or Junium, June. The mm. month of June, that, that's, the, that's the modern equivalent. So what's right. happened? It's back. You know, remember Jesus said that they will return to the house that they left. Well, wow. June was once the house of this goddess. She's returned to the house. June has returned to its pagan state. And there was a sign of the goddess. You know what the sign was? So one of the signs was the sign of the rainbow. So when you you see the spread of the rainbow, I mean, it's kind of crazy. It doesn't, it's not logical. Rainbows are on cereal boxes now. They're on American embassies. I mean, we've never celebrated sexuality, any sexuality. We've never had a month. You know, there's no nation that would celebrate something more than their own founding day, their Independence Day, one day. But they'll celebrate 30 days all across the world, sexuality. I mean, it's not natural. It's not regular. It's supernatural. And so this is happening. I'll I'll share one more thing. And then we get to where we are, the war and what we need to do. I'm sure we want to get to that. Um, But the one other thing is even the Supreme Court is part of the mystery because there have been three major Supreme Court decisions that have altered sexuality and altered marriage was the final step. And what happened in 2003, one in 2013, 10 years later, and the other was 2015, was the striking down of marriage as we know it. And so the amazing thing is the time of the goddess, I said, was especially June, but especially the last days of June around the time of the summer solstice. 
The first one in 2003 happened in June, month of the goddess, last days of June, time of the summer solstice on June 26. The second one, 10 years later, striking down the Defense of Marriage Act, that happened in June, last days of June, time of the summer solstice, days of the goddess, same day, June 26. Wow. The third one, we all remember it, the striking down of marriage as we have known it, as we've all known it, happened June, month of June, last days of June, time of the summer solstice, days of the goddess, same exact day, June wow. 26th, which is linked to the mystery of the goddess. And if you remember that night when marriage was transformed, that night the White House was lit up in the sign of the rainbow, which is like mm. the goddess saying, I have the White House now, I have the nation now. The thing is that the date of that night on the ancient calendar was the 10th day of Tammuz. The Bible speaks of Tammuz and so does Babylon. I found an ancient inscription, I put it inside the Return of the Gods, where in Babylon it says that that day, the 10th of Tammuz, is appointed for the casting of a spell to cause a man to love a man. That was the day that marriage was transformed for a man wow. to love a man. Here in the United States, wow, yeah. And that's just three of the signs, y'all, that uh, like that are happening in modern times that are in this book. There are several other ones where I was just it's almost unbelievable when you read it until you realize that there was a spirit behind it. You know, it's not just happenstance. It's not just coincidence. But something is behind all of this and essentially trying to get revenge, you know, trying to weave I, itself back in. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if we're fighting against a spirit, not just individually personally but as the body of christ and even as a culture what does that look like what is their yeah. goal and how do yeah. we fight this war yeah yeah you alluded to something and it's important you know you know remember that these spirits were cast out by the gospel they were cast out by a christian so when they come back they've got a vengeance and so yeah. i mean it makes sense so they're going to focus number one they're going to have a focus on christians who cast them out they're going to try to now marginalize christians cast them out of the culture they're going to try to cast the word of god out of the culture because the word of god cast them out of the culture you know they're going to wow. try to encroach on the worship of god religious freedom because their worship was encroached upon so right. we're in a war and the, the last part of the book gets into that and they're ultimately seeking and you alluded to this at the beginning and that is that you know they come in promising freedom that when they came in it was all tolerance you know openness mm. you know it wasn't about openness that was only the way to get into a christian culture that hey consider new things you know open yourself up once they get in and once they pos they start possessing the culture then it's not so much now about openness and about tolerance right. now it's about you conform or we cancel you now mm. it is every you know the, the gods always end up saying every knee will bow to us every tongue will confess think about jezebel think about ahab think about baal think about elijah okay so now we're in this stage where it's if you don't think the way we think we will defund you we will fire you, we will cancel you, because that's wow. exactly what they do. So, by the way, this goes totally dovetails what the Bible says about the end times. You know, it talks about persecution, it talks about before the coming of the Lord. So the thing is this, number one, we have to fight. Number one, we, this is not mm -hmm. the time to be intimidated. The, the spirits want to intimidate God's people. We cannot be intimidated, that's number one. We cannot be silent because they want to cancel, we cannot be canceled. You, you cannot agree to that, number two. The other thing is that if you have anything, and this goes right with, with your heart, uh, Troy, if there's anything in your life that is linked to these strongholds, you have to get it out. And whether it's sexuality, mm -hmm. whether it's materialism, whether it's what, whether it's abortion, whatever it is, you know, whatever that dark thing is that's not of God, you know, you have to get out. Because remember Gideon, he was a hero of God, a great hero. But before he could be the great hero in the culture, he had to first do something. He had to, he had to smash the altar in his backyard of Baal. So the first yeah. thing is smash that altar. If you prayed with us beforehand, you've already begun it. It's already, we're already there. But smash that. God will deliver you, but make it impossible for you to go back. Whatever that is, take it out of your house, take it out of your life, take it out of your, that, that whatever you have to do. Then, as Troy said, there is freedom. Once you do that, there is power, there is freedom. Then be a light to the world. We are not the first people dealing with this. In fact, you know, for most of Bible times, they dealt with these things. You know, Moses dealt with the gods of Egypt. Elijah dealt with the gods of Canaan. You know, the, the yeah. you know, uh, Paul and the first Christian dealt with the gods of Rome. It's always been, you know, so we're not the first, but now it's our turn. And so the thing is, we have to be strong like they were strong. They did not back down. They stood up, not on their own power, but the power of God. 
The last part of the book is called The Other God, because the fact is we have the one true living almighty God. He is more powerful. You know, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, he wrote a song, and he said in Hebrew, Micha mocha be'elim Adonai, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? There's no comparison. There's no wow. comparison with God and these spirits. There's no comparison between Jesus and anybody else. There's just nobody like our God. You've got the power. Even though the culture will tell you you're on the losing side, you are on the winning side. You have always been. And, and you know, this is all going to pass, but you and God are not going to pass. And so the thing is that we have to stand in that power, in the confidence that Moses stood in, Elijah stood in, Gideon stood in, Paul stood in. We have to stand in that power. It's the same God, but now we're on the playing field. So this is the time. So for me, Troy, there's something exciting about it because if the dark's getting darker, listen, the lights of God have to get brighter. And the thing is that these are the times that produce greatness because the grays disappear. So you got to go with the dark, you got to go with the light. But if you go with the light, you're going to be even more anointed because if the world is going back to the way it was at the beginning of the age, it's time for the people of God, for all of us to go back to the way it was at the beginning, to go back to the book of Acts, you know, to be mm. the book of Acts believer, you know, and, right. and so, you know, to me, Troy, you know, like the thing about like, when is the most exciting time of a movie? The last 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. God has put us at the most exciting time. If you will stand, you will be great. God will, it says the eyes of God, the eyes of the Lord, they search the entire earth looking for the one whose heart is completely his. You be that one. He will lift you up. He will show you mighty things. This is the time to rise. That's amazing. One of the things you included in the book is that Jesus or Yeshua actually means the Lord is salvation. And I, I love that so much because there may be someone watching right now who you met, you might have prayed with us earlier but, but you know that you still need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, you, you maybe, and that's where I was. I was in church and I believed in God. I, I mean, I even believed that the gospel was true. I just didn't fully understand it. And I had not made Jesus the Lord of my life. You know, I thought that I was earning my way to God, but I had not received the salvation of God. And 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, now is a day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. So I want to make that clear to anyone listening. Today is the day of salvation. You don't need to go one more day without knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So Jonathan, do you mind if I pray right now with, with, sure, with people? If you're listening, you're watching right now, and you say, I've never done that. This is not a magical prayer or anything like that. This is a decision you make in your heart to turn away from every other God and to make Jesus the Lord of your life. So I want you to pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, we repent of all of our sin right now. We choose to believe that you are the son of God and that you also came to the earth as a man, that you lived a perfect life yes, and that you died on a cross. And when you died, you took the punishment for all of our sins upon yourself. And we choose to believe right now that on the third day after you died, you rose again. And now you are, are, have ascended into heaven, Lord, and you are seated at the right hand of the Father. And I want you to say this in your own words to the Lord. Lord, I give my life to you right now in every way. And listen, if you're listening to this and you just need to come back to the Lord right now, maybe that some of those other things have gotten in, just come back to Jesus right now. Kick those other things out. Just, as Jonathan was saying, just kick them out. Just make no room for the enemy. Make no room for any of his ways anymore. Say, Jesus, I open up every part of my heart to you, every part of my life to you. Holy Spirit, look in every single closet, every single room of my heart, every single room of my house. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you not only cast those things out and you set me free, but that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you fill us with a passion to spread the gospel message, that you fill us as your people with a passion to see other people set free in Jesus, to see the light of the world spread throughout the world so that people can truly be set free by the Son. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. So Jonathan, Amen. thank you so much for joining me today. Y'all, again, the return of the gods, 
there's a link below, but also it's available anywhere books are sold, amazon.com. It's available on almost anywhere that you find books, you're gonna find this book, which is, which is just really cool. And I also encourage you, get it for people in your life, pray for them because we, we need to get set free and we need to pray for revival. That's something right. else. Because without revival, America's lost. You know, this is the one thing. We have to pray for it, but not just pray for it, we have to actually live in it, you know, choose it for ourselves. That's how it spreads, you know? So we need to do that. Uh, there's always hope with God. We're speaking about big things that we're all dealing with, every single one is dealing with, but we gotta remember the biggest thing is God mm -hmm. in everything. You know, the Bible says we war not against flesh and blood. We war against principalities. We gotta know what we're dealing with, but then we have to deal with it with God. God is our everything, and he is more than a match in your life for victory. It says, you know, I just spoke about this yesterday. He gave a scripture. Thank, it says, thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph. Always, not sometimes. As long as we'll go, we'll get it. So this is great stuff and it's exciting time to be alive. And Troy, I just want to thank you for what you're doing because I, I discovered you through everybody saying, hey, this is guy Troy, you know, and he's speaking about this. And you have such a great spirit for a real heart for people. It's not only it's prophetic, but you have a heart for people. It's very sincere and it's very life-changing and life-affirming. So, and what I've seen from doing this here, it's all the more. So keep up the wonderful work that God has given you. Um, and it's, it's a, a joy to be with you. I appreciate that. It's a joy to be with you too, Jonathan. Thank you again so much for joining me. Y'all get a copy of the book. I love y'all so much and I'll see you next time.